I'm Sean Denale, the CEO and owner of Mountain Rose Herbs, and we're here at the headquarters for Mountain Rose Herbs. It's a four-acre industrial campus in the heart of West Eugene, also known as West Industrial Eugene. Uh, we're quite lucky because this four-acre industrial campus affords us the opportunity to act as land stewards for wildlife and habitat. And when we took possession of this building 10 years ago, behind me was a large mountain of blackberry. Uh, and when we moved in, I told our facilities manager that I wanted to install a bioswale. And 10 years ago, you could imagine the look on his face. He said, what is a bioswale? And when I described the ecological importance of a bioswale, he said, okay, great, I'll look into it. About a week or two later, he comes back and he says, you're not going to believe this, but we already have a bioswale. And I said, where is it at? And he said, you know, in the back of the building where that big mountainous pile of blackberry is, it's right underneath all of that. So what we did is we began to uh, trench all of that blackberry out, grub it out, and then enhance the entire area with native species and species that specialize in bioaccumulation and nutrient uptake. Bioswells are important in industrial environments because through impervious surfaces like concrete and asphalt, stormwater runoff has PCBs, it has dioxins, it has lots of pollutants. Here in the Willamette Valley, all of our stormwater runoff discharges directly into our highly revered and esteemed Willamette River. I don't want to contribute to the pollution of our Willamette River, so that's why I made it a priority to enhance our industrial campus to capture all that stormwater runoff. And that's what we've done here with our bioswell. But also what's unique about our campus is that it's managed for both native plants, pollination plants, and wildlife habitat. What we inherited was a more formally landscaped uh, industrial campus, and where we've moved it is more of a native landscaped um, area. And we were honored to actually be one of Eugene's only certified organic accredited landscaping um, organizations, and we used a landscaper that specializes in certified organic landscaping. And as a result, uh, we've improved the area with pollinator species and native species and as a result we have a plethora of wildlife that comes in here and I want to emphasize once again that we're in West Industrial Eugene. There is no property like this that I know of in West Industrial Eugene. So we have beaver, we have mink, we have river otter, we have deer, we have bald eagles, we have osprey, we have a plethora of wildlife habitat that we didn't see when we moved here 10 years ago. But as a result of transforming this more into a holistic native landscape, we're definitely seeing the benefit that it has for wildlife and also the benefit that it has for us as individuals and as people, because we love coming out here and connecting with wildlife. And this is a rare opportunity in West Industrial Eugene. And I'm happy to introduce Eric with Friends of Trees. We've partnered with them for m several years. They've helped us enhance this landscape, and we've also worked on numerous other tree planting efforts throughout Eugene. Hi, this is Eric Burke with Friends of Trees, and uh, representing the Friends of Trees Eugene Springfield office. We're super excited to be here today and partnering with Mountain Rose Herbs on these uh, series of tree walks. Um, this one on the Mountain Rose Herbs campus here, looking at some of the excellent restoration work that's been done here, some of the cool trees around the campus. Friends of Trees is a community-based nonprofit that serves, um, our office serves the Eugene Springfield area, and Friends of Trees as a whole works in the Pacific Northwest. Our mission is to bring volunteers together to plant and care for city trees and we have uh, a bunch of different programs getting volunteers engaged to plant trees, prune trees, care for trees in many different ways, and we have uh, a lot of different programs to do that. Our planting season starts November 14th this year, and we're, we've been piloting corona-safe ways to do uh, volunteer events, and we just wrapped up our volunteer pruning program, and our summer inspector program and we're gearing up for our tree planting program. We're super appreciative of Mountain Rose's support for our work. Um, we've been working together for I think eight years now and um, several of our plantings um, would not have been possible without Mountain Rose's support. There's a great planting near here. We're gonna have one of these tree walks at um, near Beltline and Danabo and Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, where we're, Mountain Rose has supported us to try and extend the West Eugene wetlands and the wildlife habitat from that 
into the core of Eugene by um, planting along the Amazon Channel corridor and the bike path that follows that into Eugene. Um, we're going to be looking at a bunch of the native trees here today, and I think Anna is going to be talking about some of those native trees. Hi, my name is Anna Bradley, and I'm the sustainability coordinator with Mountain Rose Herbs, and I am a naturalist, survivalist, and tree lover. And today I'm standing with some native trees that we've planted with our partner, Friends of Trees, who is going to talk about some of these awesome trees that we have here on our campus. Right behind me is a Valley Ponderosa Pine. We've got California Black Oak, Oregon White Oak, White Alder, and Oregon Ash. And today I'm going to introduce Eric Burke of Friends of Trees, who's going to go around with us today and talk about these amazing trees that we have right here on our campus. Today we're standing next to this Valley Ponderosa Pine, as Anna mentioned. Um, it's Pinus Ponderosa subspecies Willamitensis. Some people put it in a different subspecies. It's a variety of the Ponderosa Pine so many of us are familiar with that's adapted to the wetter climates of the Willamette Valley. So it's different than the ones on the east side of the Cascades. It uh, is very tolerant of poorly drained soils. It grow, it's very drought tolerant. It grows really well. It's one of the trees that does better than most other trees in our area. So now we're standing in a little mini grove that Mountain Rose staff volunteers planted here of these California black oaks, which is Quercus kelagii. California black oak is a really neat, it's one of our two native oaks to Eugene Springfield area. And it's kind of special because most people think we only have the Oregon white oak that's native here. And Oregon white oak goes from Mexico up to Canada and to Vancouver Island. And California black oak comes from Mexico just to about 10 miles north of Eugene. And that's as far north as it goes. And all the oaks in the world are divided into two groups, the white oaks and the red oaks. California black oak is in the red oak group. And they're a little shorter lived. They still live two, 300 years compared to four, 500 years for a white oak. And um, they produce acorns that are phenomenal food sources. Um, California black oak was a major food source for Californian indigenous people and for Oregon indigenous people. The Kalapuya here in Eugene um, continue to use um, California black oak acorns. They have really pretty leaves. Um, Oregon white oak leaves turn kind of a brown with a little red and rust color in the fall. Um, California black oak leaves turn um, pretty red. Um, sometimes they're, they're almost a bright red in the fall. Um, these guys have pointed tips on the lobes of their leaves is one of the difference between red oaks and black oaks. And uh, California black oak do well um, mostly on the hillsides of South Eugene is where you see them, but they also surprisingly come down into the wetlands into the poorly drained soils and grow there too in some situations. So now we're going to take a look at what the classic tree of the West Eugene wetlands, the Oregon ash. Its scientific name is um, variously Fraxinus latifolia or Fraxinus oregana. Um, it's our only native member of the olive family in here in the Willamette Valley. It's in the Oleaceae uh, or the olive family. Um, and ashes are um, interesting in one way in that they are dioecious in that they have separate male and female trees in almost all the ash species except one I believe. And so here we can see um, that uh, this tree Right here, these are the remains of the female flowers that have mostly fallen off. Um, so this is a female ash tree. I don't know, uh, I can't really tell if this is a male or female one. In the very early spring, they start developing their flowers. Um, ash are, have opposite leaves and um, pinnately compound leaves. So um, this is one leaf with um, many leaflets and um, Another thing that's interesting about different ash species is they turn different colors and that's one, in the fall and that's one way to identify them. So the American ash 
turns red for the most part in the fall. Pennsylvania ash turns yellow. Oregon ash, um, like many of our um, trees, turns a combination of brown, yellow, orange, and red, um, along with uh, mottledness from a, a fungal foliar disease that gets these guys a lot called anthracnose. And you can see some of the um, contortions and speckling on the leaves from that. They grow right through it. They have really stunningly beautiful buds. I, I love the buds on ash trees and the flowers. Um, they belong here. They, they grow better in the wetland soils than any other tree except probably for willows. And um, before um, Euro-American settlement of this area, um, Doug Furs uh, without fire would have taken over the entire landscape except the active floodplain southwest facing hillsides and then these wetlands which were too poorly drained for Doug fir to really thrive in and so ash um, ash can live in standing water where there's almost no oxygen for its roots and so if you like uh, are like me and we're a little kid walking around neighborhoods in Eugene um, you'd see these growing up in cracks in the sidewalk in what we call the clay belt of Eugene, the, the parts of southwest Eugene that are built on wetlands um, like this. And ash just love it here. They, they do really, really well. And it's a tree that we're planting both in uh, restoration projects, but we're also trying to bring it into the city as a street tree. Um, now we're going to look at white alder. The scientific name is Alnus rhombifolia, and it's different than um, the two most common alders around um, Eugene and, and Western Oregon are the white alder and the red alder. Alnus rubra is the red alder, and you can tell them apart in a few different ways um, by the tooths on the edge of the leaves, and also the red alder, the edges of the leaves are slightly curled under, and um, white alder is a little more common uh, on the edges of oak savannas and on dry, drier landscapes than the, white, than the red alder, which is more common in the coast range. It's the tree that um, you see logging companies spray after clear cuts um, because it competes with the trees that they want to grow. Um, the thing that's amazing about these guys to me is that they're the only tree that I know of that is um, that has a relationship with rhizobium bacteria that fixes nitrogen from the air that isn't in the legume family. So a uh, pretty unusual characteristic of these trees when they come in after a big forest fire classically in the coast range or the Cascades they um, fix about as much nitrogen as logging companies add with helicopter fertilization now. So if you just left these guys they would um, fertilize the soil, and they're very short-lived. They live about 40 years, typically, 40 to 80 years. And um, typically, they come in after a big fire, re-fertilize and cover and protect the soil. They grow really fast, and, and then they die and are replaced by dug firs and other conifers in our um, forests in the Cascades and Coast Range. Um, I love planting these around the city. I planted one in... Um, the house that I uh, am just moving from in over by the fairgrounds in Eugene. And in eight years, it was about 30 feet tall and about this big in diameter. Very fast growing, um, really strong wood, um, useful for a lot of different things. I've made atlatls out of um, alder and um, they have beautiful wood. You can't quite see because this is so dense below, but their um, bark, um, is very, it's like gray um, skin-like um, bark that's really attractive. It has lots and lots of um, lichens and liverworts that grow on it in the forest. Um, one thing that's interesting here is uh, these four white alders in the, in the grass here were all planted on the same day. And this one's really big and growing super fast and thriving. And the other ones are, are not establishing quite as fast. And so you can see that there can be huge microsite differences that these guys respond to. Um, really great tree in restoration projects. They tend not to like super poorly drained soils. Um, and so 
The other thing is along the Willamette River in Eugene, almost everyone thinks that the, uh, these guys line the river in many places in Eugene, and most people think they're red alders, but almost all of them are white alders. So a really nice tree for a lot of different uses.